Hi there. Um, uh, I'm back. Um, I know I've been on quite the hiatus from recording videos. Uh, it's been a hectic last year, but uh, I'm back. So, um, but I'm going to shift my focus away from anatomy and physiology for a little while, and I want to try to get a lot of videos up uh, about pathophysiology. Um, now, before I get into this, I mean, this is obviously the first of many videos that I want to record relating to this topic, but I just want to say that if you, if you don't have a strong background in human anatomy and physiology, um, you know, I strongly recommend that you maybe want to hold off on going through these videos just because, um, I'm, I'm going into these, I'm going into this, this subject with, um, basically with the idea that people that are watching these videos are people that are currently enrolled in a pathophys class are people that are far into their courses or careers and are reviewing for board exams and whatnot. And anywhere you take a disease or a path, a pathology or pathophys class, at the bare minimum, you have to have human anatomy and physiology first because this is a course that revolves around you know, disease and basically what goes wrong with bodily organs. So you obviously have to have a functional understanding of everything when they're operating normally. And it's kind of hard to understand what happens when operations go awry if you don't have that foundational knowledge. So I just kind of want to throw that disclaimer, that uh, warning out there for people. I'm not saying don't watch these. I'm just saying that your understanding of these topics and concepts will be a lot more solid with uh, with an anatomy and physiology background. So on that note, let's uh, get into this. So basically, this is just going to be the first of uh, many lectures on pathophys. And um, in this video, we're going to cover uh, a lot of a lot of introductory topics, or we could say foundational topics, that are going to be important, and you'll see a lot as you go through not just the course of this class, but just as the course uh, of your college education and into your career. And, you, and a lot of these terms are probably going to be familiar to you anyway, because you hear a lot of these terms and concepts used on the news. Um, you know, on the news, or um, if you, you read them in a in a newspaper article, a journal article, a magazine. Whatnot. So there's going to be a lot of foundational topics here to focus on. All right. And one of the things, though, that we do need to focus on is understanding the difference between pathology and pathophysiology. And then we'll talk about clinical manifestations and some terms that are associated with signs and symptoms, and then terms associated with diagnosis and treatment. And then we'll kind of talk about disease on a larger scale and talk about populations. So basically, in a nutshell, in this video, you're gonna get, you're gonna have a lot of introductory terms thrown at you, um, that again that are related to the entire duration of this course. So, first off, let's talk about the difference between pathology and pathophysiology. So, I mean, basically, whether you're taking a pathology class or you're taking a pathophysiology class, you're revolved. I mean, these classes revolve around disease. All right, these classes revolve around disease, plain and simple. And I, I, I'm going to apologize ahead of time for my handwriting. I'm using some new, newer gadgets and technology here, so bear with me. Um, and basically, diseases occur when homeostasis goes awry. And remember, homeostasis is a state of balance when um, functions in the body are operating we can, uh, under normal conditions. We can compensate for environmental stresses and pressures. All right, um, you know our blood pressure rises and falls on a daily basis depending on our activity, but we can, on our own, keep it you know within the normal functional parameters that keep us healthy. But if we are unable to do that on our own, then, well, there's going to be problems. All right. So basically, home, you know, disease is homeostasis gone awry. All right. And basically, you know, pathos means feeling or suffering. And basically, whenever you see this word root patho, you should just automatically think disease, plain and simple. All right. Disease, disease, disease. All right. And then ology, you know, a little terminology review is the study of, all right, all right. Now this is where it gets to be a little different. So I mean, you see patho, pathology, ology. So obviously we're studying diseases, but from different perspectives. All right, because basically physis means nature or origin. You know, it's a you know again a Greek term, and obviously you see this in physiology. All right, and physiology, you know, is basically function. All right, or the mechanics of the body. All right, so the mechanics of the body. 
so basically pathophysiology is understanding the mechanics of disease and understanding this really from a cellular level. So what happens at the cellular level in organs that cause them to function abnormally? Whether it's an infection, whether it's just mitosis gone wrong, a cancer, genetic disorders, and so on. All right, so basically pathophysiology is like anything else in physiology. You're looking at the step by step by step by step mechanics of a disease. Whereas pathology is more related to anatomy. Pathology is identifying diseases, um, you know, predominantly through, you know, dissections, microscopes, uh, and so on. Because, like, you know, when you hear about a pathologist and what a pathologist does, um, you know, you hear about them doing dissections and whatnot, but they do far more than just do autopsies. I mean, they have to sample tissues, stain them, look at them under microscopes to identify the cellular changes. All right, so, so when you see pathology, you think, anatomic changes in the body that cause disease and pathophysiology would be the, the cellular mechanics that allow a disease to progress. All right. Um, and again, you have to bear in mind though that, uh, you know, that all this revolves around homeostasis and a state of balance. All right. And if we lose our state of balance, then that is going to require medical intervention. All right, because that's what this is all about, and and typically this gets this this ability for us to physiologically stay balanced gets a lot worse as we age. All right, you know, just as our body deteriorates and um, just undergoes the normal processes of aging, which will be one of the last topics we talk about. Uh, you know, more medical intervention will be necessary. All right. So etiology, let's talk about this term first. This is a term you're going to see a lot, all right? And this is a very straightforward term. Etiology, you're just saying, all right, the cause of a disease. All right, what is the etiology of this disease? All right, and there are various causes of diseases out there. All right, and one of the most common agents or causes of a disease would be a pathogen. All right, so this would be a good opportunity for you to just maybe pause for a second and you know take your pen and your notebook while you're sitting here watching this and try to write down examples of what you think various pathogens would be. So do that for a second. All right, so examples of pathogens could be bacteria. All right, could be a virus. All right, fungi which isn't very common, more common in immunocompromised patients, but, um, but bacteria, you know, viruses, fungi, um, you know, those are all examples of pathogens. Basically, another way to look at a pathogen as well uh, would be environmental agents that can cause diseases because, for example, there are, um, you know, there's more than just environmental pathogens that can cause diseases. There are, you know, genetics is also a factor here. All right, so genetics. So, you know, bad genes um, could be, you know, for example, there are certain cancers that uh, are within family, that are within families, hypertension, and so on. All right, so you have to keep that in mind that, you know, that it's more than just the environment that's causing problems. It could be us as well. All right, and some terms that are related to uh, etiology, one of them being multifactorial. All right, multifactorial. Basically, multi, you know, multiple, many, and, well, factorial factors. So basically, when you see this term, what we're saying here is there are many factors that are contributing to a disease. All right, and that just kind of goes right back to what I just, what I was just talking about, is that many diseases are a combination genetics and environment. All right, um, you know, for example, uh, you know, like if you think about like high blood pressure, I mean, high blood pressure is very common in families. All right, but that doesn't mean just because high blood pressure is in your family doesn't mean it's, you're going to get full blown hypertension. And you know, hypertension is the uh, clinical term for high blood pressure, and it's just going to run out of control. I mean, you know, you have to manage your lifestyle as well. I mean, especially if you know that it's in your family history. All right, if, if cardiovascular disease in general is in your family history, exercise eat right, all right, manage your stress, all right, there's more, you know, again, it, it, it's, 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 there's always multiple factors that go into a disease. So just because you know that uh, a particular disease is in your family history doesn't necessarily guarantee you're going to see the most severe effects of it, all right, and that's not always the case, um, you know, like, for example, with Huntington's chorea, for example, I mean, you have a 50-50 chance of inheriting that disease, 
there's not much you can do about that, all right? But, you know, but there are also many diseases, like, again, like high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, and so on, that are very manageable, all right? So multifactorial, many factors that contribute to a disease. Nosocomal, all right, basically when you get sick in a healthcare environment, all right, or what are often referred to as um, uh, hospital-inquired infections, or HAIs, all right, H A. I. All right. So now you're probably sitting here thinking to yourself, well, how do people get sick in a hospital? Because, I mean, I mean, hospitals are supposed to be sterile. You know, hospitals and clinics alike are supposed to be very sterile, clean environments. All right. Well, they're not perfect environments. You have to keep that in mind. All right. And there are, you know, factors that can lead into this. You know, probably one of the more common examples of a nosocomal infection is MRSA. All right, MRSA, M-R-S-A, all right, which stands for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It's a bacterial infection that that occurs in, in hospital settings, all right. Typically, um, it's very common in patients who have weakened immune systems, are often undergoing dialysis and kidney treatments, all right. Um, it's called um, methicillin resistant because this type of um, Staph aureus is resistant to, um, you know, that particular antibiotic. All right, so that's something you have to keep in mind. And that's kind of how they, you know, and, and bacteria become resistant to antibiotics from exposure to antibiotics. All right, so, um, you know, that's not the most, you know, again, that's not the only example of hospital-acquired infections. I mean, probably the most, in the United States, the most common would be UTIs, all right, would be a u urinary tract infection. And more often than not, UTIs come from, um, they don't, they're not always the practitioner's fault, but oftentimes they can be. Um, if you don't follow the procedure of cathetering a patient correctly, um, you know, if you contaminate the, if you contaminate the catheter and still continue to, you know, put it in the, in the patient, all right, oftentimes with indwelling catheters that they're left in for too long, um, it's almost guaranteed if they're left in too long, a person, a patient's going to acquire an infection. I, I said, I said almost guaranteed. I don't want to make it sound like it's a hundred percent. All right. Um, oftentimes with surgery as well, uh, patient surgical wounds get infected. All right. And, uh, you know, which, which sometimes is going to happen. I mean, just because we have a lot of microbes on our skin and if we don't properly clean and treat the wound, then, you know, it's going to happen. All right. If we don't take the right precautions. But, um, so, so oftentimes, you know, the nosocomal infections can be caused just the environment you're in, uh, by not maintaining a sterile environment. All right. Or sterile procedures, just flat out negligence, all right, and that's something. Now that's something you have to keep in mind because um, uh, because these w when these happen, especially if it's done through negligence, that's going to cost a lot of money. Not just the patient, but the hospital. Because you have to remember, you as a healthcare professional, you are a representative of the clinic or hospital that you work in, all right. And when you make a mistake and a patient has to suffer the consequences of it. The whole clinic suffers the con or hospital, the, the healthcare facility suffers the consequences as well, you know, through lawsuits, processing, and so on. All right. It get, those get to be expensive. So the moral of the story here, people, is pay attention to what you're doing. All right. As a student, you know, going through this, you need to make sure that, you know, when you're, when you're teachers, whether you're going to nursing school, whether you're going to school to, to be a doctor, uh, medical assistant, surge tech, whatever it may be, you need to make sure that you follow directions and you master these skills that you're being taught because you're being taught these for a reason to uh, take care of the patient. All right. So those are nosocomal infections. Um, uh, iatrogenic infections, basically, the, or, uh, or diseases are caused by treatments. All right. Um, and various, you know, again, various, uh, causes of these, probably the most common cause, especially what you hear about here in the United States a lot is you guys watch TV and it's, this just drives me bananas. When you see all of these pharmaceutical commercials on TV, all these medications are being marketed out there. And doesn't it just drive you nuts that half the time the side effects are either worse or the same as, uh, or there's, there's more <laughs> than what the person actually has. So if you have an adverse reaction to a medication, all right, that is an atrogenic, um, an, an atrogenic cause of a disease. Uh, I, I still never, it, it blows my mind when I see, you know, uh, commercials on TV for 
um, antidepressants and they say, you know, side effects of this could be nightmares and suicidal tendencies. Well, call me crazy, but don't those and depression probably not mix very well together. Um, uh, you know, or if they cause, you know, leaky things to leak out of orifices of your body, I, I don't know, call me crazy. I'm just not a fan of that. So, um, but again, these are, you know, your, your treatments, you know, like for example, uh, you know, we know there's a lot of adverse effects with chemotherapy when we're treating cancer. Um, you know, I've known, I've known patients who have come out of chemotherapy, granted they, their lives were saved as a result of it, but who've come out, you know, as, uh, as diabetics and so on, hypertension and whatnot. All right. But, but oftentimes, you know, I mean, but, but the thing is though, is these treatments aren't going to be administered without the patient knowing of, of all of the potential effects, because that is illegal to do that. So that's something you have to understand as a, as a future healthcare professional is that it's your job to make sure the patients are educated as to the, you know, about the treatments that they are undergoing, because there are certain risks with these. All right. Um, all right. And another thing that I want to mention that can go along with both nosocomial and iatrogenic are documentation errors. All right. Documentation errors. Make sure you're documenting properly as well. All right. Because, you know, if you write down the wrong dosage, wrong medication, you mix up patients' charts. All right. That, that could get people killed or severely hurt. All right. So that's something you have to keep in mind. And I know this is going to sound hypocritical me saying this right now, but write legibly. All right. Idiopathic. Idiopathic. Idio basically is Greek for idiot. Um, and so basically, from a professional standpoint, we are calling ourselves idiots because we don't know the cause of the disease. Um, so basically, whenever there's a disease out there that we don't know the cause of, that's idiopathic. All right. Um, you know, we know with a, with a lot of diseases, there are certain factors that can contribute to the persistence or the development of a disease, but the flat out cause, like for example, I mean, just even high blood pressure, primary hypertension, we don't really know what causes that. All right. Um, you know, obviously we know a lot about the effects of it and how to treat it, but we don't really know the cause of, of primary hypertension, something as simple as that. All right. And there are many other diseases out there as well, but we know how to manage them. All right. So whenever you see idiopathic, basically just think no known cause. All right. So remember etiology, is basically the study of the or is the causes of disease all right and there are various factors that can contribute to disease ranging from our own biology and genetics to environmental factors and, and various pathogens out there in the environment all right so let's talk about signs and symptoms all right now it's important to understand the difference between these two all right so basically a sign is an objective measurable um, manifestation all right, an objective measurable manifestation. And a symptom is unobjective. It's often a feeling that the patient is experiencing. So again, this would be a good time to maybe pause for a second and think of some examples of each, uh, you know, kind of categorize these examples and see, um, you know, see what you can come up with. Now, if you go down here, I put two images down here. All right, this is a person running a fever and this is a patient uh, who's getting an injection and doesn't look like they're having the best of times. So let's think about this for a second. So over here with this patient, would this be an example of a sign or a symptom? This would be a sign. All right, because see the thermometer here? The thermometer, basically, we can measure the temperature. When a person has an infection and they're running a, and they're running a fever, we can measure that temperature, okay? So fevers are a sign, all right? If a little kid falls out of a tree and they land on their arm and they break it and a bone is protruding from their body, I think it's a pretty obvious sign that maybe they broke a bone, okay? Um, you know, if a person is has severe edema, all right, and you can see the water welling up in their tissues, all right, that is a sign that there is edema, all right? So you get the picture here. Basically, what you as a healthcare practitioner can see and measure yourself, that is a sign, okay? Whereas a symptom is an unobjective feeling, all right? Now, I don't want to don't want to sound too, I'm not saying unobjective to be crass or to take away from what the patient is experiencing. It's just that, for example, I mean, this is obviously pain right here. Okay, that's pain. All right, now how people experience pain, I mean, that varies a lot from person to person. You know, culture 
has a lot to do with how people perceive and uh, show pain. Uh, gender has a lot to do with it, all right, because females are known to have a higher tolerance for pain. Age, personality, I mean, there's a lot that goes into that goes into pain. I mean, granted, if you're a guy and you value your life and you have a beautiful gal who's pregnant and giving labor or experiencing labor pains, Use your head and not tell her that. Oh, honey, it's it's it pain. The pain is only subjective. It's in your head. If you value your life, don't do that. All right, but um, but you get the picture here. I mean, it, uh, you know, uh, one person could experience stomach cramps very differently from another person. So you have to. So that's why when it comes to pain, you have to ask very specific questions to try to pinpoint. You know, is it on a scale from one to ten? One being Barely any 10 being the worst pain you ever felt in your life. Um, is it burning, numb, tingling, so on? Is it persistent? Has it been getting worse? Is it, you know, I mean, so on. I mean, there are, the, there are these certain questions you're going to get taught to ask patients just to try to identify pain. Uh, nausea would be another example. All right. Now, now off because nausea doesn't off doesn't always mean a patient's going to project that projectile vomit. All right. But vomiting would actually would obviously be a sign that something is wrong. You know, stomach infection, fever, uh, you know, GI disorder, or whatnot. All right. But you got to remember, just because a person is nauseated because they feel sick or queasy to their stomach, it doesn't mean that they are um, going to vomit. All right. But obviously, something is you know probably wrong. All right, so signs versus symptoms, and a clinical manif and, you know, as I said before, these are examples of clinical manifestations, and you have to remember, basically, when we're talking about clinical manifestations, we're basically talking about what are you know how is this disease presenting itself? All right, what can we as a practitioner measure, and what do we have to rely on from the patient to give us information about that? All right, so you know, you it's important to understand the difference between local and systemic. Local means within a specific area, whereas systemic means basically think system wide, body wide. All right. So again, if someone, you know, again, go back to the example of a of a kid. If that kid fell out of the tree, you know, broke their bone, and the bone is protruding out of the arm, it's it's safe to say that's local. Okay, it's safe to say that's local. All right. If someone has sepsis, that's going to be systemic. You know, basically blood poisoning. You know, bacteria getting into the blood. Um, you know, there are certain, like, in, like uh, you know, uh, severe allergic reactions, you know, like anaphylactic reactions, all right, are going to be fairly systemic because you're affecting essentially more than just one area. I mean, many areas of the body at once are being affected by that, all right? So local is isolated to one area. Systemic is more widespread, all right? Acute versus chronic. Acute basically means rapid onset, okay? This, this, the, you're, you're seeing the signs and symptoms of this really fast right away. Whereas chronic, what we're saying here is over a long period of time, persistent, all right? This disease is, it may be taking a while to manifest, but it's not going away, all right? All right, like for example, uh, diabetes, like type 1 diabetes is an example of a chronic disease, all right? Um, you know, it takes a little while for the, for the you know, just because of how it manifests, um, you know, because you typically like with type one diabetes, it doesn't hit until, you know, kind of the, you know, five to seven to eight years old, even in, in, into the teens. All right. But, uh, but that's a disease that sticks with you for life. I mean, granted, we're coming up with treatments and remedies for that, like, uh, pancreatic islet transplants and so on. But if you don't get one of those and it doesn't, or you do, and it doesn't really take that well, they are actually fairly successful right now, but that's a, for another topic for another day. But you get the picture here. Chronic disease is a persistent disease, you know, hypertension. As another example of a chronic disease, all right, you know, an example of an acute would be, you know, you have a fever, you know, you get the seasonal flu, all right, you know, it's going to, it's going to hit you pretty quick, it's going to last for a few days or a week, and then it's going to go away, all right, so acute versus chronic, acute, rapid onset, chronic, persistent over long periods of time, all right, insidious basically means gradual onset, okay, Basically, um, gradual onset, and not just gradual onset, but cumulative effects. Or think cumulative. Uh, a good example of this would be stress. Now, stress isn't always a bad thing. There is such a thing as good stress, which we'll talk about later on. But in general, when you hear about the word stress, you know, when you hear the word stress, you think bad things. You know, like a job is stressing me out, a relationship is stressing me out, financial woes are stressing me out, all of the above. 
all right, um, whatever it may be, all right, you know, the stress can come in negative effects or it can come very negatively. And if you don't manage that stress well, I mean, the effects of that will just pile on over time because the effects of stress don't hit you right away. Like, for example, when you think of someone developing an ulcer, all right, those don't develop within a day. Those take, it takes chronic stress. It takes, a, you know, it takes, it, it takes persistent stress for for that ulcer to gradually develop, all right, due to lack of blood flow to certain organs, all right, immuno, you know, immunocompromised and so on. Okay, so that's insidious. Exacerbation. I bet this is a term a lot of you have heard before. Basically, exas when you, when you hear when you see the word exacerbation, that just basically means you're making something worse. All right, you're irritating, you're increasing this, you're enhancing the signs, you're enhancing the symptoms. All right. Um, you know, the, the signs or the symptoms. All right. Um, you know, like it, like you hear this a lot with people who have asthma, like the, like someone will say, um, uh, you know, I was around a cat and it exacerbated my, uh, asthma or so on. All right. So that's all that word means. You're just making, you're just taking something that's already there and making it worse. Okay. Subacute. Basically, this is a, 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 a clinical manifestation or problem that kind of falls right in between acute and chronic. Um, you know, like for example, um, uh, like endocarditis for like subacute endocarditis, basically, a which is essentially a heart infection. All right. Um, you know, it's an infection that kind of, you start to, it, it slowly takes the little bit of time for the effects to accumulate, but then they get worse over time. And if left untreated, that will, I mean, it takes, I mean, it could take up to a year for to see, you know, severe fatal effects, but it's something that you can manage even without treatment for a while. But obviously if you have a heart infection, get it taken care of. All right. So subacute is just kind of in between these two. Well, that kind of it is. All right. Now remission. This is a, I think this is an important word to talk about because this is a word you hear a lot. Now, it's important that you understand this definition here. Symptom-free period. Symptom-free. That doesn't mean the disease or the problem has gone away. It just means that you are not showing any signs or, 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 or I'm sorry, not showing any symptoms of the disease. I mean, for example, I mean, the most common example you hear remission being used is with cancer. All right. Now, just because someone has gone into remission with cancer doesn't mean the tumor has gone away. Oftentimes, it just means the tumor has maybe shrunk a little bit or it's not growing. All right. And it's not causing any more negative effects. So you have to keep that in mind. Remission isn't always a golden ticket, but it is news you do want to hear. All right. So keep that in mind. Symptom free periods. And asymptomatic. Um, you know, basically whenever you see the, whenever you see the letter A in front of something, that means without. Okay. So if someone is asymptomatic, no noticeable symptoms. All right. You know, for example, you know, hypertension, high blood pressure, there are no signs or symptoms of that. People typically don't know they have high blood pressure until it's, it's, it's persisted so long to the point to where it's starting to cause um, you know, vascular damage and so on. Most of the time people figure out our diet, you know, figure out they have high blood pressure when they, uh, you know, go in for the regular checkup and, you know, they're, they get their blood pressure measured and it's abnormally high. And then you have it measured a few more times because you can't just go off of one reading. Um, and it stays, you know, and it's, and it is persistently high, then you would say that, you know, this person would be diagnosed with hypertension and they have to figure out how to treat it. All right. So asymptomatic basically means no noticeable signs or symptoms. In terms related to diagnosis and treatment, um, basically what we have, you know, a diagnosis is basically a labeling a disease. All right. You're identifying a label, an identifiable label. I mean, and, and I mean, every time you hear someone uh, give the name of a disease, that's a, that's a diagnosis. And obviously in order for a healthcare professional to make a diagnosis, all right. Yeah. I mean, some are obvious, you know, again, kid falls out of tree, bone protruding out of arm. I don't think you need to be a, a highly trained professional to figure out the kid broke his, his or her arm. All right. But, uh, there are many, you know, many diseases out there that require lots of testing. All right. You know, uh, uh, taking samples from patients, all right, running them through labs, um, patient questionnaires, you know, I mean, gathering a patient history. And it's important. That's a really key part of that is, is getting a patient history, making sure the patients are honest. All right, because it is, I mean, oftentimes patients do lie. 
All right, it's not just some thing they made up for the TV show House MD. I mean, that is pretty true. I mean, you know, lying is a defense mechanism. All right, and especially when it comes to medicine, because I mean, we don't. I mean, initially, we don't want to admit that there's a problem. All right, it's just you know, it's our it's our unconscious psychology kicking in and saying, I, I don't know, you know I, I, who who would want to who would want to actually face the fact that they have cancer or admit that they that they just have some kind of a problem in the first place or that they or that, or that they have a behavior that is leading up to that all right so it's important that you gather the appropriate information from a patient so a proper diagnosis can be made all right so hold your patients accountable basically is what i'm saying now a prognosis is basically forecasting outcomes i'm sure that's a word you've heard a lot about now you have to bear in mind that a prognosis is you're not guaranteeing anything with a prognosis all right, you're just saying that, look, there's a certain chance that if we undergo this treatment, the survival rate is X plus Y equals Z, essentially. All right, so you have to keep that in mind. A prognosis isn't a guarantee. You're just basically laying out the outcomes and figuring out what path will work the best, which treatment path will work the best. Some patients may decide to go the homeopathic route. Some will go surgery. Some may try pharmaceutical. It depends on the situation because the prognosis is going to vary from patient to patient. All right, so that's so that's something you have to keep in mind. Is 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 a prognosis? You're forecasting outcomes. You're not giving guarantees. All right, and then morbidity versus mortality. All right, now these are often terms that are used uh, that are associated with populations. Morbidity is basically a disease rate within a population, whereas mortality is a death rate within a population. Obviously, you know, oftentimes there's a strong correlation between the two. All right, you know, uh, morbidity and mortality. All right, you know, if there's a higher prevalence of a particular disease in a population, um, there's a chance, depending on the disease, that it could cause a higher death rate within that population. All right, um, you know, and, and obviously there's a lot of specifics that goes into this. You know, you have to look at um, everything from, you know, what is the average age range of this population, race and, race and ethnicity of the population, what are their living conditions and standards like. Um, I mean, there's a lot that goes into morbidity and mortality, all right? And the CDC puts out a weekly um, morbidity and mortality report uh, on a weekly basis. And if you go to this website here, um, you can actually see... Uh, you know, it's all free information because it's, you know, it's public information through the government. Um, but, uh, you know, you can, you can look up, uh, morbidity, mortality rates of very specific diseases within your states. Um, uh, you know, within the whole country. I mean, there's a lot of information out there related to this. All right. So morbidity is disease rate. Mortality is death rate. So, well, let, let's let's give an example of this before I go on. Instead of just you know, f you know, flapping about the terms, let's uh, let's talk about um, I don't know. Let's talk about obesity. Okay, obesity, and I'm just going to abbreviate this: cardiovascular disease. CV, cardiovascular, not resumes. All right. So. If we find a so oftentimes in populations where there is an increased rate of obesity or just even overweight, out of shape people, there oftentimes is a higher prevalence of cardiovascular disease. And then obviously, what do you think the death rate is going to be like that's related to this? All right. So that's something I have to keep in mind. And obesity, I think obesity is a little bit of a loosely used term because um, people who are obese are have lots of body fat, lots and lots of body fat. They're way over their 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 weight and body composition for their age range and so on. But but you know, but again, whether you're overweight or obese. Those are contributing factors to cardiovascular disease. And if there's a higher prevalence of cardiovascular disease in that population, well, guess what? There's probably going to be a higher rate of as well, a higher death rate. All right. And that's basically what the CDC and other, you know, organizations do. Um, that's what they're trying to control when we're trying to, you know, basically get people to be healthier. All right. You know, get them in shape so we can lower the risk of this. And basically, if we cut these down, we lower death rates in the population. All right. So you see the connection there. Hopefully, hopefully I explain that well enough. And then the last thing I want to talk about is population health. All right, epidemiology. 
All right, epidemiology is a study of, of diseases within populations. Don't confuse that with etiology. Remember, etiology is, just a, is, is the study of causes of diseases. Epidemiology is studying populations or studying diseases within populations. All right, and that essentially is what that morbid, morbidity and mortality report that the CDC puts out on a weekly basis is doing. They're studying and assessing various diseases that are within populations, uh, how they affect those populations, and obviously that information gives you um, prevention and treatment outcomes. All right, so incidence and prevalence. Let's talk about the differences between these two. Incidence is the rate of occurrence, whereas prevalence is the percent of um, is the percent of the population that's affected by this. So, for example, in 2006, there were 56 um, there were 56,000 people diagnosed with AIDS in the United States. All right, and during that time, the population was about 300 million. All right. So basically, so what we're saying here out of the, so out of these 300 million people in the United States, you know, the incidence of AIDS would be 56,000 people and the prevalence of AIDS would be right around 19%, about 18 and a half, 19%. Okay. So almost 20% of the, but either way, whether it's your, it's 18 and a half, 19%, Almost 20% of that population of the population in the United States was diagnosed or identified to have AIDS. Okay, so that's basically what incidence and prevalence is. And I chose this one because using cardiovascular disease and obesity would have been way too depressing um, for the United States. Not that this is uplifting by any means, but um, but you get the picture. All right, and then some other terms that uh, important terms I want to talk about are. Endemic, epidemic, and pandemic. All right, endemic, epidemic, and pandemic. Endemic. It's a, you know this is often this is a very common word. I mean this is a word you see like used in anthropology, sociology kind of studies as well. Um, when you hear about a, a group of people that are endemic to an area, you know it's a population that's isolated to a specific area or lives within a specific area. All right, and the same goes for a disease as well. Um, basically a disease affects a, you know, kind of a regular to a smaller area. And then an epidemic means a disease is spreading to a, you know, basically more widespread. It's spreading basically throughout the country, getting larger and larger. And then pandemic, we're basically talking about crossing borders. We're talking about worldwide crossing continents. All right. So again, let's use the example of HIV and AIDS. All right. You know, endemic. All right. You know, if we look at the history of HIV, um, you know, basically, you know, it's pretty much been, you know, by, by most, uh, you know, virology professionals out there, it's, it's been found to, it, it, it's been, you know, known that it's originated in West Africa. All right. You know, within the, the Congo jungle, if I remember correctly, all right, areas of the Congo in West Africa. Now, um, basically that occurred, uh, because of, you know, you know, individuals that, that were endemic to that area, um, you know, we're eating monkeys, which obviously you have to, you have to eat. All right. And there was a, um, a different version of this called SIV called simian immunodeficiency virus. All right. And then basically what happened was, you know, whoever was uh, hunting and whoever hunted and killed the monkey had to butcher the monkey. And then there was, you know, basically this virus, you know, if that, and then that hunter had a, had a cut on their hand and that, you know, there was basically blood to blood, uh, mixing contamination. All right. And then, you know, this version of the, of the, of the virus is relatively harmless, but once it got into humans, it evolved into what we know of as today as the HIV virus. All right. And then it kind of stayed endemic within that area. But then as people, um, and you know how HIV is spread, you know, primarily through body fluid contact and so on. And obviously in this situation, primarily, uh, more, more likely than not through sexual contact. All right. And, um, and then as people branched out from here and moved to more populated areas, uh, then this became more of an epidemic. All right. Then as people, as, as people started emigrating and moving out of the continent and to other areas, then that makes, I mean, HIV and a, I mean, or I should say AIDS, HIV is the virus. AIDS is a pandemic. It is a worldwide problem. All right. Um, so that's something you have to keep in mind. 
So that's what these terms mean. And don't let the media throw you off, like with that whole H1N1 snafu a couple of years ago when they, you know, they threw this word around like it was going out of style. Oh, if we don't do this or that, you know, this this worldwide pandemic. I mean, the seasonal, I mean, flus circulate all the time. I mean, it was understandable to 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 keep an eye out and be caution, you know, have caution about that virus because it was a slightly newer version of that of the uh, strain of that H1N1. But I mean, to scare the crap out of the entire world the way they did, um, I don't know. I I just wasn't a fan of how the media and the government handled that. Uh, but I'm not a fan of how they handle most things. So. Um, and if there's any viewers on here that want to get into conspiracy theory or listen to Jeremiah Wright and talk about how, oh, no, HIV was a man-made creation targeted to kill certain groups of people, uh, save that garbage, please. I don't want to hear it. Um, you know, again, uh, you know, people that say that are people that have no biology background, uh, you know, when you take a look at the people that are actually spouting that stuff. So, um, so that's uh, pop terms related to population health. And then last I want to talk about is disease prevention. And as future healthcare professionals, you have to know and understand that this is one of the most critical parts of your job is preventing not just um, uh, patients, but yourselves from getting ill and sick. And there are three forms of prevention out there primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary is when you take direct action to prevent yourself from getting injured, sick, or harm. You know, like uh, putting on a helmet when you're getting on a skateboard or wearing safety goggles, just wearing rubber gloves when you're going in to examine a patient, do a physical examination on a patient. All right, all of those are examples of primary prevention. You are taking precautions yourself to deal, to, to not get sick or not get hurt. Secondary basically is early detection. I mean, obviously, the most common thing you hear about would be, um, you know, the like the self screenings. Um, you know, like uh, like uh, females checking for a, you know, uh, palpating your breast to check for lumps. Uh, guys palpating the um, scrotum to test for lumps to self assess for breast and testicular cancer. Uh, mammograms, uh, prostate checks. I mean, you, you get the picture here basically using medicine to, uh, you know, detect if there's a problem and to, you know, nip it in the butt as quickly as possible. That's a really bad example to use after I talked about prostate exams, but you get the picture. Um, and then tertiary prevention is obviously when a disease has been identified and basically we need to treat and rehabilitate the patient from that. All right. And unfortunately, this is probably the biggest part of medicine today in the United States. Luckily, it is taking a shift more towards here and here, but there's still a lot of work that has to be done. I mean, you know, society, there's a lot of mentality changes that have to occur in society. For example, people have to stop blaming Twinkies for making them fat versus, you know, sitting on your butt, eating them and not exercising and wondering why you got fat. All right. I mean, people need to undergo the right behaviors to prevent problems. All right. And if there is a problem, early action, all right? But until, I mean, it's, it's more than just medicine making the shift. Society has to make the shift as well. And this quick fix mentality that is out there needs to go. It needs to stop. This pointing the finger in every direction, you know, except ourselves, that, that mentality has to stop. And you as future healthcare professionals need to be on the front end of that, all right? But this is basically the first video of uh, pathophysiology and a lot of introductory uh, terms and concepts. And, you know, I should, you know, just show that I properly cited my sources for all the images that I used in here. Um, you know, again, if you have any questions, uh, you know, let me know and uh, just keep an eye out because I'm going to try to put these out on a weekly basis.